which we are now going to take a little uh, shift in the program. It's going to be audience participation. Um, I'll bring all our expert panelists and speakers to the front. I will uh, introduce you to um, the Unicorn Foundation's net nurse, Kate Wakeland, who's come all the way from Melbourne. Far away. Okay. Well, I'll say a very quick hello. And I've spoken to lots of you on the phone and I've emailed with lots of you. So when we have our... Um, once we've finished, we'll have some supper outside and I'm looking forward to putting some faces to names because it's just really exciting to be here. A couple of things I did want to say. Um, the first thing is that we will be having... Um, we've got an evaluation at the end of the evening. Please don't leave without filling this out because it's going to give us really important feedback for planning future events. The other thing I would say is that I did bring a few booklets along. We've got two... Oh, we've got two of the same one. We've got um, two booklets. One is for healthcare professionals and one is for um, patients or carers. Um, and it's a, a lot of really comprehensive information about neuroendocrine tumours. Um, I think they've all gone from the table. So if you would like a booklet, let me know and I can make sure I've got your details and I can send one out to you in the mail or you can download it from our website. So we were going to have some time for some questions and answers. Um, and um, so let's open it up to the floor. Has anyone been brewing questions? Did anyone come with questions? Or a... So in that center inside scheme, it looks like... It looks like to me it's 45 patients worldwide. So, and there's how many centers? Seven centers. Seven centers. So if... Seven Seven patients and you're done. Well, no, it, it's, it's best in best stress. So yeah. If we can do a control nets and get uh, half of them, then we'll be very happy. Um, but I, I, I think it's a funding issue. I think they're, they're looking at 45. And also... Um, well, 45 is a standard phase two study. So so can everyone hear without the microphone? Or would it be better if we were passing the microphone? I'll talk louder. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so we're going to get a few patients on that study and I assume that Ipsen has patented the molecule. That's correct. Well, Optrifon patented, Ipsen bought Optrifon. Okay. So it's going to be expensive. It won't be, we it won't, know. it will be, it won't be twenty four. it won't be $10,000 a dose. It'll be at least thirty to 40000 a dose. But that's a, the argument that they'll put to government. So that won't be necessarily yeah. an argument that they'll sell to patients. Yeah. That's an argument they'll have to have with government. And that's so just uh, from a medical oncology point of view, most new drugs that come on stream now are costing between about 100 and 140000 a year for treatment. And that's where pharma usually pitches it. And it's a problem in all Western societies as to how to pay for all this stuff. Gentleman there, yeah? Yeah, I was just going to ask, you said that one company bought out another. Is that Australian-based companies? Or are they no, they, uh, Oxford yeah, Farm, I think, or? was Belgian or French. Yeah. And, and Ipsen, they're worldwide. But Ipsen's French. So they were French. Yeah. Okay. Now that we are going to use the drugs here without too much happening. Most of the drugs that were currently used were developed in Australia. Yeah. other questions that people have got from the audience? Because I've got some I've got a list of frequently asked questions that I get asked on the phone. So I might I might pop, I'll, I'll pepper one in and then that might stimulate some discussion because I don't want it just to be about me and a, a bunch of um, very eminent um, specialists. It's actually you know, it's important that we that we're um, we're answering the questions that you've got. So um, a lot of the questions that I get um, on the on the net nurse line are actually, you know, this has been really comprehensive information about the clinical trials and it's been really interesting for me to watch. Some of the questions, a lot of the questions I get on the net nurse line are actually coming right back quite a way. Um, and given we've got you in the room, I'm going to pick your brains. So there's a whole heap of questions, a whole heap of tests that someone will have when they're diagnosed with a neuroendocrine tumour and certainly words like chromogranin A and 5-HIAA and um, 
the various types of PET scans and, and other scans. Can I just ask, what about if the blood tests like the, the chromogranin A and the 5-HIAA are normal, does that eliminate a neuroendocrine tumour diagnosis? The answer, yeah, the answer is no. So, Please explain. <laughs> okay, so the diagnosis of neuroendocrine tumour is made when you see neuroendocrine cancer cells under a microscope. And that's basically the bottom line. And so the chromogranin A is just a blood test and you can have a neuroendocrine tumour and it doesn't produce chromogranin. So therefore the chromogranin is normal. And 5-HIAA is part of the hormonal process. So if you don't have a hormone secreting neuroendocrine tumour, which is only 20 to 30% of urinary 5-HIAA is normal. I think the point also has to be made that there are the conditions that can increase the chromogranin A as well as some medications that can elevate the chromogranin A. So it's not really specific. That's a question over there. Thanks. So can I ask, what does, what does the P67 actually, the P67, what does that actually mean? And why is it, was it important for that study that we had less than 20%? Is that right, Mr. Turner? Yes. Yeah, good question. Oh, thanks, Nick. So the KI67 is, a, uh, is an index of proliferation. So what does an Sorry, index of proliferation just, I've mean? Little, I've got, <laughs> yes, exactly. I've got my little Japanese antenna, and I, when I hear so, a word okay, that I wouldn't have understood back. without my nursing degree, I'm going to pull you up. Yeah, so okay. proliferation. So, so one of the questions, when I started, started off, I said that, that neuroendocrine tumours were a spectrum of cancers, from really slow-growing cancers to really fast-growing cancers. And that's brought out by the fact that in some of those studies, you had no treatment and the disease was stable for a couple of years. Um, so sometimes you can live with this tumour, not do very much, and it won't, it, it'll just sit there and not grow. So the KI67 is a method of trying to estimate how fast the thing's going to grow. So the lower the KI-67, the slower growing the cancer is. The higher the KI-67, the faster it grows. How accurate is the test? Which is the next thing. Because when you sample the tumour, you sample less than 1%. When you do a biopsy, you know, you've got this lump of cancer. You put a needle into it and you suck out, you know, 0.5 of a millimetre of tumour and then you look at that under the microscope and then the pathologist does their calculations. So um, we look at it and we do take some notice of it but you know s certainly when, when we look at things we don't just look at the KI-67 in isolation. It's a clinical trial thing. We also look at how fast the cancer seems to be growing if we have serial imaging. So if, we, if you have a scan from six months ago and you have a scan now, there's been a delay in the diagnosis and, you know, we aren't, nobody's really twigged to it for a while and so then eventually somebody gets around to doing a biopsy and then they find they've got a neuroendocrine tumour and then we find that there's a scan that was done six or nine months beforehand the difference between the scan now and scan nine months ago is probably a more accurate indication of how fast the thing's growing than the KI-67. It's quite a difficult concept to grasp, I think, but uh, cancers aren't all the same. I mean, cancers come from the people who develop them, uh, and cancers are pretty similar uh, in many respects to the to the person who hosts them. They're, they're part of them. And just as everyone in this room is a person, we're all different. Well, the cancers that we develop might all be called, for example, a neuroendocrine tumour, but they're all as different as we are between, between each other. And so we need to do a lot of tests to decide 
okay, it's a neuroendocrine tumour because someone called it that under the microscope, but uh, is it a rapidly growing one or a slowly growing one? Is it one which is going to respond to treatment X or is it going to respond better to treatment Y? And unfortunately, most of the tests that we have answer one question. So if there are 10 questions that need answering, then you've got to have a lot of tests to, to answer all of those questions. Also, when we're running research studies, it's very important for the research to be of high quality that certain conditions are met. Uh, and so people who are enrolled in research studies often have a lot of tests that they might not necessarily have if they weren't in the research study in order to ensure that the research is rigorous and of high quality uh, and will withstand criticism. You sh should also realise what is being looked at when the key 67 is analysed. And the German pathologist who looked at the system has a classification which requires the pathologist to count 2,000 cells in order to arrive at the percentage for the key 67. And pathologists don't do that. They look at the, uh, the stain section, look at a hot spot in a corner and count at that, that level. Now having said that, if you've got a borderline key 67, you don't have to accept that because you can do other tests. For instance, the standard test that you're having is gallium-68 octreotate PET-CT. If the key 67 gets above 5, that's usually supplemented by a fluorine 18 FDG PET-CT, which shows you the level of differentiation in another way. Another complication is it depends where the biopsy was taken. If the biopsy was taken from a metastasis or if the biopsy was taken from the primary tumour, the key 67 may differ between the two. So there are a lot of variables and you have to achieve a certain amount of comfort with uncertainty because no one can give you precise answers to any of your questions at this stage. I think uh, I just wanted to add that the K67 index, particularly for patients with uh, grade 2 tumours, is really very wide. Uh, if you find patients who are at one extreme end at the low grade end and another patient who is at the higher end of grade 2s, are they really the same disease? And the reality is probably not even the same disease, but it's just a, matter, a, a way of standardising and classifying patients. Tumours can be heterogeneous, and often they are heterogeneous. So you can actually find pre-existing within the same person and the same tumour cells that behave differently. And over time, you can see the differences as you follow the patient up. I kind of have two questions. Following on the KI index, is there any use in retesting it after a certain number of years? That's one. And secondly, is there any point in having a genetic testing? I'll try and answer the first question. Uh, somebody else may answer the second question. Uh, patients who progress on progression, sometimes it may be worthwhile rebiopsying patients because at presentation and on progression, you may actually be looking at two different diseases. So it's always worth considering rebiopsying certain patients or biopsying areas that are progressing because the K67 index in those areas may be vastly different. Uh, the other tool that our Professor Tanner mentioned is doing two PET scans, one the gallium 68 and the FDG PET for high-grade tumors or high-grade transformations or patients who progress with high-grade disease, the PET scan can actually suggest that the patient you're looking at who has previously had a low-grade tumor and has been followed up for a low-grade tumor for several years is now actually behaving as a high-grade patient and their FDG PET is expected to be positive. Those patients will require chemotherapy. Uh, there's no such thing as a PET scan as such. I mean, a PET scan refers to a type of scanner, a machine that people go into, but the type of PET scan that we do varies depending upon what chemical the person's injected with. 
So there are dozens of different kinds of PET scans uh, and the one that we use most commonly in patients with neuroendocrine tumours is the gallium octreotate PET scan um, which measures the somatostatin receptors on the tumour. When tumours start to become more angry uh, and behave more like other cancers uh, and so they grow, may grow more quickly and spread more rapidly uh, then they often become gobblers of glucose uh, and that's what we measure with a, a different kind of PET scan called an FDG PET scan. So if we want to know where on the spectrum of behaviour a neuroendocrine tumour might be, sometimes we have to do both of those PET scans uh, and we may repeat the one that seems to have the best information. We may repeat both of them. There's a limit to how much we can throw at people though before they start getting sick and tired of us and so it always becomes a balancing act between what will give enough information to help make decisions uh, without going overboard. So I the issue becomes if you're living a reasonable amount, you know, a longish time with your cancer and, and for some of us like me, I treat adenocarcinoma of the pancreas and the median survival for patients with adenocarcinoma of the pancreas is nine months. So when we see patients with, with survivals that are measured at five and seven years, we, our frame of reference is sometimes to the more common cancers. Uh, but you guys are different. You have a different sort of cancer. Um, and your frame of reference is a lot longer than the average cancer patient. So for net patients, should you do serial biopsies? Like every couple of years, you re-biopsy the cancer to see what's going on. Well, it's a lot of biopsies. Biopsies, I've never had one, but they don't look all that comfortable to me. <laughs> and uh, there is a risk when you have them. If you, you know, do repeated biopsies of lung or liver, they can bleed, you can get holes in your lungs. That don't, and they leak air and stuff like that. So it's not something that we do that I certainly don't do on a routine basis. And I would reconsider rebiopsying if the behaviour of the disease is out of, is, is not what I would expect. So like thinking, oh yeah, this is going along like an average neuroendocrine tumour, we'll just plod along and not do another biopsy. If something really happens that's out of left field, then perhaps I might consider doing a biopsy in that situation to see what's changed under the microscope. But you still have a sampling error because you only sample a small bit. David, do you have an opinion about genetic testing? Which yep, I think so I'm going to answer that now. <laughs> <laughs> Just checking. Yeah, so this is the second, so I've done, done the first bit of the question, and that is, do you have serial biopsies? And, well, my feeling is generally no. Um, so the next question is, there's this technology around where you biopsy the cancer and then you send it off to a whole number of labs um, but, and there's a number of labs around the world where you can, where, that perform the testing and the lab will run a whole lot of analyses and then come back with recommendations as far as what treatment you should be on. So, and um, uh, I have been majorly underwhelmed with the results of of that sort of approach. Uh, so I don't. Uh, so when patients come along, I don't volunteer the information, um, and I don't talk about it. Uh, if patients ask about it and saying, look, why don't I have my tumour sent off to f Florida and they'll give me a result and tell me what drugs you should put me on. And what my response to that is, is, is okay, yes, we can do that, uh, but the chances of you getting something really good out of this is pretty low. And it's a bit hard to know what it is, what that chance is at the moment, 
but the chances of getting a drug that lasts for more than six to 12 months is probably around 5%. And you've got to pay $7,000 for the biopsy, and then you're probably going to be recommended some drug that's not PBS subsidised. So you're going to be up for the full cost of the drug. And that's, you know, and that's a bit of a deal, particularly if the drug works. <laughs> because if it works, you're on it for a year, so you could easily be looking at 100000 a year for your drug. And that is beyond the reach of the average person. The question of whether somebody who has a tumour should have genetic testing um, is complicated. If you have had more than one cancer, that doesn't include skin cancers because skin cancers are very common, then it's worthwhile considering. If you come from a family with lots of patients, particularly with related malignancies, then it's a, it's a question that needs to be discussed. Can neuroendocrine tumors run in families? Yes, a small percentage of patients can have clusters of uh, diseases that run in families, but that's got to be individualized to the particular patient. The family history needs to be taken, and that patient's individual history needs to be taken. There are pros and cons of having genetic testing, and there may be insurance implications of having genetic testing. Other family members may be interested in the results or may not wish to know the results. So all of those things need to be considered. I, I was going to basically say uh, uh, what Andrew's just said, but there, uh, that there are neuroendocrine tumors do sometimes come in particular type of families. So there may be a role, but it's, as you said, who do you do it to, do you do it to everyone and so forth. Um, I think, though, one of the things that is happening, and if you go to any of the oncology talks that I've been going to lately, you see more and more discussion about personalised medicine. We're starting to see that more and more. We don't really understand where we're going in some ways. But we've just had discussions saying that you're all different, all your tumours are different, and yet we treat them with one recipe. And so I think there will be a time when things may be different. And I think we're just starting to s try and understand it. You saw some of the pathways that were shown by uh, D Kevin Jasis. And there are ways now of potentially looking at that. And there are some small papers coming out saying, well, maybe we should be a little bit more scientific in the way we are treating, as we do with lutetium octreotide. If you have no somatostatin receptors, there is no role for lutetium octreotide. So we look for the molecular signature and we treat you with that if you have that signature. So we're starting to move down that path, but it is a difficult path because it's not simple to get 10 patients all with slightly different characteristics and then develop a trial with a whole multitude of different chemotherapy agents. Firstly, the drug companies aren't interested in that, and it's a really difficult study to do. But I think we are going to start seeing over the next 10, 15, 20 years a much more personalised approach to the way we treat cancers. So um, we need to distinguish two types of genetic testing. There's the genetic testing that's an intrinsic problem with every cell in your body. And that's the sort of Angelina Jolie problem. She has a mutation in her BRCA gene and that's in every cell in her body. And therefore, she can go along to the doctor, she can have a blood test just out of her arm here, can be sent off to a lab, and she, they can identify the mutation in her BRCA gene, and then they can say, well, look, you know, you need a bilateral mastectomy to decrease your risk of breast cancer, and then we're gonna test your children, and we can tell you if your children carry that mutation or not. So that is genetic testing looking for familial cancer syndromes. And we can do that and we can... And for neuroendocrine tumours, it's pretty rare. You know, uh, so the common ones are BRCA for breast cancer and ovarian cancer and, and Lynch syndrome for 
um, endometrial cancer and colon cancer, and there are a few others, but for neuroendocrine tumors, it's pretty rare. Then there's the other genetic testing, and that is where we run genetic tests on your cancer and only in your cancer. Because what happens in cancer is that all the genes that drive cells get messed up and we can look for drivers of cell growth in your cancer cell. And you need to distinguish between those two because they're entirely different questions. They're still under the label of genetic testing, but they're asking entirely different questions and will give you an entirely different result. Hand up, yeah, great, thank you. Um, are more people being diagnosed with them now, or is the diagnosis just better? I'd never heard of them until a year ago. Uh, it's quite a prevalent disease. Yes. 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 Because, they, because you, you live quite a long time, you start seeing a prevalence. So even though the incidence, so the number per thousand per year is low, but as... Uh, David said, unlike pancreatic adenocarcinoma, where your life expectancy is only a short period of time, uh, people with NETs are still here at 5, 10, 15. So when you start saying that they, they almost accumulate over time. There's not as many people as you needed a cocktail party were going to save your life. I've got a neuroethical view. What depends? Yeah. I mean, they. <laughs> No such thing as a dumb question, thank you. <laughs> We're here because of nets, but you the medical people, you know what it is. Us, the patients, we do all our studies, we know what it is. You're at the cocktail party, someone asks you a question, what's wrong with your nets? I've got nets, what the hell is that? And then you've got to go into this explanation. That. What is the generic way that we can answer that? As of earlier today, <laughs> you for travel insurance, I had to go through what neuroendocrine was. Neuro? Can I spell it out? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, what? I was in nerve endocrine hormone, and then it was just this guy didn't want to spend me about travel insurance after that. <laughs> what yeah. most people would have heard about would be carcinoid tumors. That's what uh, neuroendocrine, classical low grade neuroendocrine tumors, have been called uh, carcinoid tumors for years until uh, relatively recently when classification has become more and more uh, sophisticated and tried to class them into low-grade, intermediate, high-grade uh, neuroendocrine cancers, which all behave differently and the treatment is different. It's really trying to identify these patients, uh, these diseases, classify them better, treat them better, heading towards what has been alluded to, which will be personalized medicine in future which is the second genetic test that Dr. Ransom was talking about. The first one is just to work out your risk, your familiar risk. The second is molecular profiling and genetic testing, which leads to personalized medicine. But a lot of this is a research area. The targets haven't been identified clearly, and the molecules to target them or the targeted therapies are not really here yet for most of these diseases. People around with not particularly common diseases. In fact, not particularly common diseases collectively make up a huge part of the disease burden that populations face. Uh, and they're not terribly well serviced by regulatory authorities because uh, they're not terribly well serviced by uh, commercial enterprises because they're not going to make much money out of them. Uh, and so people with not particularly common diseases are caught between a rock and a hard place. They fall between the cracks. Uh, but neuroendocrine tumours, uh, whilst they're not particularly common in terms of the number of new people who are diagnosed every year, in Europe they are the second most prevalent form of gastrointestinal cancer. So after conventional bowel cancer, the next most likely cancer that you'll find amongst a group of people in Paris or whatever like that, is, is neuroendocrine tumours. So there are lots of people living with them, uh, but, uh, but it's not terribly widely discussed. Uh, and one of the problems in, in all of these not terribly common, not especially rare diseases is being able to marshal sufficient interest and funds to, to conduct research to develop treatments because they may well be very treatable, uh, but they just have fallen under the radar of all of the commercial enterprises. 
Another question, is a question there. At this current stage, there's no formal lobbying from WA Nationally. That's a leading question. Yeah, um, so the Unicorn Foundation, it's a, it's a great question actually because it's something that I wanted to mention is that um, we've recently formed a consumer advisory group um, and a, a large part of the function of that group is to, for, to lobby on a national level um, for increased government funding for, and it's, it's both things like the scanning, so the availability of, of pet scanning and the, the big out of pocket costs for people with scans, but, but the treatments as well. So um, on a national level, Unicorn Foundation are, um, are gathering momentum. It's a, it's a new group. And actually, I was going to say our WA representative has just moved to Melbourne last week. So there is a vacancy <laughs> on the working group. From, and, and we would really like to have a WA voice because I believe it's really important that we have representation across Australia. So if you're interested, not looking, <laughs> come and talk to me afterwards. That's, um, I thought it was my job to ask the questions, not be put on the spot. I think um, all the government hospitals are run by the state. Yeah, and and something that's very apparent to me, you know, working on a national level, is that each state is, is in a structure of the medical system, and each state is so yeah. confounding, mind-blowingly different. Um, and it's a good question. I think, you know, Unicorn Foundation is a very small organisation and so we're looking at, well, what can we do? And it's also a national organisation, so it's looking at, well, what, where do we start? Um, but, I, yeah, it's a question that is worth asking. I mean, there is a, uh, informal government funding in WA and, in fact, on a national comparison basis, it's pretty good. Uh, so patients with neuroendocrine tumours here uh, can get their PET scans for free, uh, which they can't do in other states. Mm. Uh, in other states they might pay $800, $1,000, $1,200 per scan. Uh, and if you're having three or four in a year, then that's a significant amount of money. As long as you go privately, though, because I'm mm. um, publicly. Yeah. Because I was yeah. private when I first got diagnosed, and I didn't see any oncologist. My surgeon just sent me straight here to all oh, down to SAD here. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, in a, so you c but you can get the scans for free, uh, and we offer them for free in in uh, public hospitals in Melbourne and Sydney. They charge the patients, but we don't. Uh, and uh, I sometimes have to get a dressing down from my bosses about how much money we're spending on these things, and I just tell them to think of a, an alternative, uh, and they don't, and uh, the argument stops for a few months. Also in this state we have, uh, through the Fiona Stanley Hospital budget, the ability to treat 26 uh, patients, new patients per year uh, with uh, lutetium octreotate therapy, uh, which doesn't exist in other states either, except uh, in uh, Melbourne where the Peter Mac offers this treatment as well. So. Uh, and again, that's the same issue. Uh, every now and then someone says, this is costing too much money. Uh, and um, But we have now an historical record going back mm, five years, more, ten years, uh, of treating these patients uh, for free in WA. Uh, and so um, I don't think anyone's likely to disturb that. But, th but that opportunity isn't available in other states, which is perhaps one of the reasons why the other states have been slow to recruit patients to this control nets trial. Now, that commitment amongst ourselves is unwavering. Uh, every time the government runs out of money, they have a look at this, but I don't seriously anticipate that they would um, overturn uh, what we've set up to date in WA. The other point worth making is that anyone enrolled in a pharma-sponsored trial, that is a trial which is being funded by a company. Uh, in, you've heard about the Ipsen trial. Uh, the costs of being a participant in those, trial, uh, in those trials are nil. So patients don't pay anything to be in a research project. Uh, but whether or not you're in a research project, uh, we have a commitment to providing both the scans and the treatment to people in WA uh, 
uh, for free if needs be. Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons why the control net study has been so successful in WA is this mode of funding which differs from that in other states. I think, I believe we are supposed to recruit eight patients and we already have more than twice that, 25 patients. And this is because we can not get funding for PRRT for these patients as long as they're enrolled in a study. Uh, the other thing that I was going to say is that at Fiona Stanley Hospital, the Medical Oncology Clinical Trials Unit, um, and Kanako is here to represent uh, the Clinical Trials Unit, they lose money for every patient on the control needs trial. But that has not stopped us from recruiting patients. There have been lots of discussions about whether we can afford to continue recruiting patients, but we're still recruiting patients. So I'm just aware that we're very short of time and there's a question in the audience. Just So we've just got time for that one question. But just before we do, I, I've got a captive audience. We've talked a lot, and appropriately so, about treatment and clinical trials and that was definitely the focus of the evening. But I'd hate to go back all the way to Melbourne without just letting you know that the Unicorn Foundation are actually imp increasing the, num the, n the amount of, I guess, support services for people diagnosed with neuroendocrine tumours and their family and friends. And so we've been um, rolling out a series of webinars. Um, also, we've got a very active support group here in WA. So there's um, and the other thing just that is that um, we're, we're rolling out a support program of one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one telephone support with trained volunteers, and that's in conjunction with the Cancer Council. So I just wouldn't want you to go home feeling like you need to do this all on your own. There are, are really great support services, both locally here in Perth, but also available via web um, you know, and via our website. So um, my number's in the booklets. <laughs> You can just Google the Unicorn Foundation and get in touch with me and I can help link you in to, I guess, just reduce that sense of isolation because when you've got something rare, it can be very lonely. So just that last question. Yeah. I was just wondering if your <coughs> trials are the only way that you can get the, uh, the drugs that are up to date that you're on, mm. on We offer it privately. So there are patients who don't fulfil trial criteria, who may want to be treated quicker than in the public sector. So we offer it privately. And it's an expensive therapy. Yeah, yeah, yeah there, there are ways and people... Um, go to other places around the world to get this. Uh, one thing I would say though is we are very lucky in West Australia that we've had the support of the state government which now doesn't have any money. And I, I, my other job is in acute medicine. So I see patients banked up in emergency departments who can't get into hospitals and there's not enough money for funding. So you've got to remember that the funding that is coming to you, it's one pot of money. And it's very generous. But what I would ask is that every time you get a gallium octreotate scan, every time you get a lutetium therapy, you write to the federal minister and you say, why is this not covered? You, because what happens is you get a complacency. You think, oh, it's all for free. Well, it's not for free. The state taxpayer is paying for this and other people are missing out certain services. They are. There's only so much money. We haven't got enough beds. We haven't got enough nurses to run the beds. And so th there is a pot of money. But I, I agree, it should be the, the biggest voice. The reason we got PET in this state was because the public attacked the state minister. Kept saying, why haven't we got a PET scanner in this state? Why haven't we got a PET scanner? And so I, I personally think to help everyone, it, you need to be saying, we're lucky, but why aren't other people as lucky as me in Australia? But as an extension to that, um, so uh, the reason why we have uh, a bias towards uh, spending the funds on people who are enrolled in trials is because if this treatment is ever going to be funded by the Commonwealth Government, they'll want to know that they're backing a winner. Uh, and the only way to prove that uh, is to have people in trials and demonstrate that the treatment works. So hopefully in five years' time, 
lutetium-177 octreotate therapy or some of that um, will be funded by the Commonwealth and it will be available to anyone who needs it without being a patient in a trial. And then we'll spend these precious funds that we have on a different trial. Now, at the moment there are some patients with neuroendocrine tumours, for example, neuroendocrine tumours of the lung uh, or of the thyroid gland, uh, or there are some people with neuroendocrine tumours of the brain which don't qualify for enrolment in the trials that we're running. Uh, and it is possible to pay and get that treatment in private uh, and depending upon how hard you twist this guy's arm, uh, it might be possible to arrange for that treatment uh, in a public hospital too where there wouldn't be any cost uh, involved and we're sympathetic to the dilemma that people are in uh, but when you've only got a small amount of money uh, you spend it in the wisest way that you can think of. But that doesn't mean that there's no prospect of you having the treatment. I mean, it's not appropriate in this room right now to discuss that. But, uh, but we do treat people what we call off, off study. However, as a whole, I can appreciate the uh, extra time that I've been given. And that's for all of you guys. Mm. So there is some federally government funded therapies for NETs. Um, so the somatostatin analogues, we sort of fandangle our way around that a bit but most of the time we write the script um, and if you have a pancreatic net there's everolimus and sunitinib are both funded by the federal government um, so there is it's it, 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 there is some federal government funding for these services uh, but peptide receptor radiotherapy is funded by the west australian government so i'm just aware that we are at time and i we did undertake to finish on time however we've got supper Fingers crossed, I haven't looked, but supper should be waiting outside. And I'm hoping that um, some of our excerpts might be happy to, to um, share a cup of tea and a bite to eat. And maybe if you've got more questions, we can um, descend on them during supper. Just another plug for the WA support group. So um, the details for that group are on our website. So we would really encourage people to make contact either with me or with the WA support group. And look, can I just take this opportunity to thank um, our guest experts here tonight? They've, they've donated their time... Um, to, to provide us with this information and, and you know, I, I just think that's incredibly generous and we're very grateful. So, <laughs> thank you.